be in this um, document, this notebook already. Um, and so you can either sort of, yeah, yeah. So you can sort of like walk through the document along with me. Um, what I'd recommend actually is making a copy of this notebook. And the way you do that is go up to this on the menu bar where it says file and then move down to save a copy and drive. And if you do that, you'll get your own copy of this notebook. So you can sort of work in that space during the class while I'm walking through it, you'll have your own private copy you can work in. So I'll give you a minute to do that. I'll show you what it looks like when, when I click on that. I get a complete copy, but um, the document's title is just like in Google Docs when you copy a doc, it's copy of the original title. Welcome, Rooksy. We're just getting started. We're all at a notebook together that the link for which is in the chat. Let us know if you um, aren't able to find it. Um, so assuming you have your own copy of the notebook, we'll just kind of walk through this together. Um, just to go over a few logistics, the, the classes will be 90 minutes in general. I'm going to turn this light off because it's super hot here in London, and I've got these bright lights on me as well. So um, the classes will be 90 minutes. Tonight might go a little bit longer than that. I'll try my best not to go too much longer, but it's an eight-week class every Wednesday night from tonight through September 30th. Um, I'm going to try to never go beyond 50 minutes without taking a break. So at 7.50, we'll try to take a maybe a 10 minute break. If I forget to do that, please remind me. Uh, all of the classes will be at this same URL. You've been using mco.fyi slash meet every Wednesday at seven for the next several weeks. Uh, here's a link, mco.fyi slash attend. You should be able to click through that in the um, notebook that you're in. And that's just a little attendance form to help me keep track of who was at which class and so on. You can do that now if it's easy. Um, if you feel like doing it later, that's fine as well. Uh, what you're looking at is a collab or a Jupyter notebook. I'll explain those terms later, and I'll tell you more about these notebooks as well. But this is what we're going to use for almost everything in this class, the lecture notes, the homework, the exercises. In each lesson, I'll share a new notebook. Uh, with you. I think it's a great environment because it's um, it's sort of like an interactive computing environment where you can read about the, the things I'm trying to teach and try them out firsthand. Uh, but I'm going to be interested in this is the first time I've taught an entire class based on these notebooks. So I'll be very curious to see how you like them at the end. The other thing that's nice about the notebooks is you kind of go into this document and you just have Python built built in. It's like, it's just there, it just works. You don't have to install anything. Later in the class, we will install Python on our laptops or our desktops or whatever, so that you have your own environment outside of the notebooks. But this is a great way to just kind of get up to speed with very little friction. I'll record the classes. We already talked about that. Um, we have a mailing group, mailing list that you know about. Feel free to ask questions there. If you need to talk to me privately, anytime, mark at mco.dev. When you're not talking, please um, mute your mic just so we don't have echo and feedback and that sort of fun stuff. Uh, but if, if you have a question, just unmute your mic and jump in, interrupt me at any time. Uh, video feeds are nice for me, but it's also totally fine to not, not to uh, mute those. If you get stuck, if you need a little bit of help, kind of an office hour type situation, I'm very happy to meet with you outside of class. So just send me an email and, and we'll arrange something. And this is a brand new course. The material is new, the approach is new. So there are very likely to be some rough edges here. And uh, I'll just ask for you to bear with any bumps we hit. And let me know if there's anything you notice that you think I can do to improve the experience. So with that, let's take a look at the textbook. There is a textbook. I didn't mention that earlier. Um, but the nice thing about it is it's free. And um, if you click on this link, it will take you to the, the home page for the book. Uh, you can buy a paper copy, but you can also read this book online. So if you scroll down to the table of contents, this is chapter by chapter, um, the, the, the entire book. 
the the chapter that relates to the lesson we're going to do today is this chapter one python basics and i'll talk more about that later that you know uh, for for your homework i'd like you to read that chapter the um the book i kind of consider supplementary meaning if you don't have time to read the re work your way through the book um i think you'll still get a lot out of this course just by attending the lessons and doing the homework um, if you really want to learn more deeply, uh, the book will be a great resource to, to work through. And I should say that, you know, you don't have to actually consume the whole book. I'm not going to cover everything in the book. As you can see, there's 20 chapters, and I'm going to do kind of a, maybe the equivalent of maybe 10, maybe half the book, probably a little bit less than that, actually. So whatever works for you, depending on how deeply you want to go. Uh, but that's a good, great resource to know about. If you do buy the copy, make sure you get the second edition because there's an older version floating around. Um, but this is a really good book for, for the kind of approach I'm trying to take with this class. Uh, just a few quick kind of meta comments about learning to program. So programming is often thought of as a sort of robotic or mechanical or a very like math and logic oriented activity. And I actually think it's got a very creative side to it, which is what makes it really fun for me because any problem you're trying to solve can be solved in many different ways. And that's where the creativity part comes in. You know, you can, you can produce something that's totally unique and it just feels really fun and exciting to, to write something. In some ways it's the same kind of feeling you get when you paint a, I've never painted a picture, but it's any kind of art you create there's some of that happening when you program, for me at least. Um, it's an amazing time to be learning this skill because the resources available are incredible. There's YouTube videos and online tutorials and all sorts of stuff. Um, I firmly believe that anyone can learn to program as long as you do the work like any other skill. Um, but practice is really important. Um, give yourself time and kind of be kind to yourself because you will get frustrated. You will find like these roadblocks where it just seems like nothing you try works. But that's just the normal learning process and try to try to just give yourself the, the space to, to, to make those kind of mistakes and learn from them. If you do get stuck, which you definitely will, um, just take a break and don't be afraid to ask for help. And one of the secrets that professional programmers all know but don't like to admit is we don't know everything. In fact, we, there's so much to know. Nobody knows um, very much, to be honest. The, the trick is whenever we need to do something, we're almost always thinking, I can't remember what function to call or how to do that, so we Google it, just like we Google everything else nowadays. I wanted to start with some background. Um, this is a kind of a cliche, but it's actually true. The cell phone that you're carrying around in your pocket has more computing power than all of the computers that NASA had in 1969 to go to the moon. Um, for the most part, we use it to do things like pay, can't play Candy Crush and other games. But I think one of the best things about learning to program is it's taking this amazing tool that we all have sitting around and learning how to you know, make it do our bidding, make it actually function in a way that corresponds to what, whatever we want it to do. It's no, it becomes more than just an appliance, um, which is really powerful. So just to get started with some concepts, some general concepts, I want to talk about something called an algorithm. And you may already know what this is, but it's just a fancy word for a step-by-step -step, uh, task. An example of an algorithm we're all familiar with is a recipe. The ingredients, you know, you put the ingredients there and then the steps to, to prepare the dish. Uh, just like programs, recipes can have errors and programs we call them bugs. There are three bugs in this recipe, two obvious ones and one slightly subtle one. Anybody want to share, point out what the, the bugs are in this recipe? I hope you're not heating the pan to 4,000 degrees. That's a good one. Probably too many, too many zeros there. Melanie's just chatted gasoline. That's another one. Can anybody spot the third problem? I stir eggs until solid. Yeah. So that would be okay if they were in the pan, 
right? But you're supposed to do that before, somehow you're supposed to stir the eggs on, I should have said over the heat until they're solid, but you're supposed to do that before you pour them into the pan. So that's an example of like the code is technically correct, but it's in the wrong sequence. So if you don't do things in the right order, you can still have a bug. Um, what is a program? Uh, it's basically an encoding of an algorithm in some language. So it's a set of instructions, just like that recipe, which tells the computer how to get something done. This collection of statements in a programming language is often called code or source code. And when we talk about coding, that's just another name for programming. The reason it's called code and coding is because we used to write software in a very low level uh, language that the computer understood directly. And it was very uh, cryptic and hard to write, so much so that people referred to it as code as if it was some you know, encryption algorithm or something. Uh, a programming language is just a set of rules for expressing uh, an algorithm symbolically. So it gives you an abstraction layer that allows you to express what you want to do without having to worry about all the, the lower level details. And it also provides a way to reuse people's work. So instead of reinventing the wheel and always implementing things over and over again, if somebody's already implemented something you need, a web server, or a, a graphing library or a data analysis tool, you just reuse it, which is super powerful because you, you kind of build in, uh, increasingly complex structures on top of lower layers. What is Python and why should we learn it? Um, Python was invented, it's a programming language. It was invented in 1989 by Guido Van Rossum. The reason why I am so excited about it is it's the most powerful and expressive language I've ever used. I also feel that it's the easiest programming language to learn, which is why I love teaching it to beginners. Um, it's freely available. It's highly, so it's open source. You can actually download the, the source code for Python itself and change the language if you want to. Uh, it's a very readable language as programming languages go. Uh, I think you'll find that you can look at code in Python and just kind of figure out what it's doing without having to think about it for too long or too deeply. It's very widely used and it's very good for the things I've listed here, data science, statistics, machine learning, social sciences, and on and on. It's really become a major, um, one of the main languages that people uh, are excited about learning and using. Uh, it's also a great thing to have on your resume. So. Um, just being familiar with it, understanding how, a little bit about how it works and what you can do with it is a great thing for your career. Um, this is a snapshot of languages and their popularity. Uh, the x-axis is the popularity rank on GitHub, and the um, y-axis is Stack Overflow. So GitHub is a place where programmers share source code and collaborate together on projects. And Stack Overflow is a place where developers ask questions and get answers. So I wouldn't take this with too much, um, to consider this too definitive because it's just one subjective way of making this measurement. But if you look on this graph, Python is way up in the right there. It's um, tied, almost tied with Java and JavaScript as currently the most widely used and um, popular languages anywhere. This is uh, Q3 2020. I'm actually, I don't know why they would say that because it's, it's the, the date on the article is June 2020. But anyway, um, the other thing I wanted to share with you is this is a graph of the same kind of information, but over time. And so Python's had quite a stellar leap in popularity in the last uh, 10 years or so. So it's, it's, very popular and getting more so every day. Uh, we could talk about the reasons why that is. A lot of it has to do with the revolution in machine learning. But uh, I think it's a great choice because the incredible way that it's um, grown over the last couple of decades. And the last kind of basic concept I wanted to mention is what is a notebook? It's, and I've already mentioned that th this is an example of a notebook. Uh, there are interactive documents where you can read text and try out your own code experiments in, in the same user experience. 
The notebooks that we're using here are called Jupyter Notebooks, so you can click through there to learn more about Jupyter. Um, Jupyter is just the basic technology that serves up these notebooks. Um, and the service provider that's actually providing the service for these notebooks that you're using here is uh, called Collaboratory or just Colab. Um, this service makes it easy to create notebooks and to share them uh, pretty much like a Google Doc. So if you click on the share button in the upper right, you'll see a dialog that looks very similar to Google Drive, Google Docs, Google Sheets, et cetera. Um, and as you saw, you were able to just directly copy this notebook. A couple short things or quick things to know about. Um, there's on the left hand side, there's this um, sort of bullet list looking icon. And this is how you um, get a table of contents for the document. And you can click anywhere here to navigate around the notebook. Um, if you ever get stuck running a notebook under runtime is restart runtime. And that will sort of redo the back end so that you can start everything over again. Um, let's see. You can create a new notebook, open it. If you open an existing notebook, you'll get a bunch of um, popular notebooks out there to, to load up. And you can also Google for, for popular notebooks and find just tons of resources to learn how to do something. Uh, let's see if there's anything else to share. Oh, yeah. Um, anytime you change your own notebook, uh, you have to save it. Unlike Google Docs, where it just automatically saves your work, uh, you'll want to explicitly save under file. You can queue up a bunch of changes, but before you reload the page, you should save it. Um, so that's notebooks in a nutshell. We can dive deeper into that if people have questions. But that's, as I said, going to be the basis for how we learn in this course. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was that there is a short video you can check out, and there's also a, a Colab notebook about Colab notebooks. So it's, a, it's that quick tour of Colab link that I have highlighted here. So check those out for next week. I think they'll help fill out some of the background on, on these notebooks. And with that, I think we'll go ahead and launch into your first Python program. So go ahead and navigate your mouse to this um, cell that says print hello world. So this is a code cell. This contains Python code. And this little sort of play button on the left, if you click that, it actually runs the code. So it should say hello world. Anybody um, maybe give me a, a shout if that's working for people. You may see a little bit of a delay, and that's because there's a computer behind the notebook that's actually serving these Python requests. Um, and it takes a while to start that up the very first time you run one of these cells. But once it's running, it stays up. So that is your first Python program. And all it did was print what you have in these, between these single quotes. Uh, we call this a string anytime we put a sequence of characters between quotes. And just for context, um, this is how I wrote the same program in 1982. Um, so it just, like, for me, that crystallizes how much programming has changed in the last 40 years and uh, how much nicer it is. I was saying earlier, like, you picked a great time to learn Python or to learn programming, because if you had done this a long time ago, uh, this is how you would have written Hello World. Um, the print function is a, met, is, a, is, a, is a capability to generate output from Python. Another useful function that's sort of the inverse of print is the input function. It's a way to draw input into a Python program. So um, the next cell is saying print enter your name colon space. So that's going to print that. And we call this a prompt because we're prompting the user to enter some input. And then we call the function name, or then we call the function input, and we whatever comes back from input we store in a variable called name. And I'm going to get into variables and assignment statements more formally. But the basic idea is we call input, it gathers some input, and it stuffs the input in a place that's called name. And then we print hello and the name that we just gathered the input of and an exclamation point. Let's run that cell and see how it looks. It says enter your name. 
So I'm going to enter my name. You can enter yours and press return or enter key. Sure enough, it says, hello, Mark. If we run it again, which we can run it any number of times, uh, say, hello, class. You get hello, class. Hopefully that's working for everyone. Um, if you have questions, just uh, interrupt me or post it in the, in the chat. Now, this, this pattern of printing a prompt and then calling input to get the reply to the prompt is so common that the input function is happy to accept a character string and print it for you. So that way you can get away with just making one function call. The input function, you pass the input function, this prompt, and the input function will print it out and get the response and return it to you, which you store in this name variable. And so basically those two lines are the exact equivalent of the previous three. It's just a simpler and more intuitive way of, of doing the same thing. You can run that cell and see that it should work exactly the same. And with that, you are now officially a Python programmer. So congratulations. That's the end of the class. Just kidding. Um, but, you know, I feel like once you've started writing Python, you really are a programmer. And so you can call yourself a Python programmer. And there's no, there's no like, uh, initiation, uh, you know, hurdle to get over. As, as long as you're writing Python code, you're a programmer. Um, our next topic I want to cover is expressions. And expressions are simply sequences of values and operator, or operations, like 2 plus 2. In fact, let's try that in the next cell. If you run that, you get what you would expect, 4. And it gives you this sense that Python essentially can be used as a calculator by just stringing together numbers and operators. The next cell is a slightly more complex version. What this is doing is I looked up the temperature in New York today, and it was 78 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'd like to convert that to Celsius. So um, I do, the, the function is subtract 32 and multiply by five nines. So I'm doing that here and I get 25.5, let's call it 26. Um, and so the, in the next cell, what I'd like to do is combine the three things we've learned, input, print, and an expression to build a general temperature conversion program. So I want to prompt the user for a Fahrenheit, a temperature in Fahrenheit uh, using the input function. I want to use an expression to convert the Fahrenheit number to Celsius. And then I want to use the print function to uh, display the results. So let's run that together. It does the prompt and waits for me to enter a number in Fahrenheit. And I'm going to enter 212. That's the boiling point in Fahrenheit, which to test my algorithm, it should return 100 in Celsius. So I'll hit enter. And sure enough, it says 212 Fahrenheit is 100 Celsius. Let's try that again and give the other interesting point, which is 32 Fahrenheit. And sure enough, that's zero Celsius. Any questions on that so far? Okay. Um, you're going to run into errors all the time. Errors are fine. You can't break the computer. An example is this 42 plus 1. Um, that's the reason that's going to fail. You can run it. Um, is that you're trying to add together two types of uh, two data types that don't actually go together in an addition operation. 42 is a number and one is a character string. And I'll explain shortly what those mean. But the error message often will help you find out what's wrong. Like this unsupported opera and type for plus int and str. You can't combine an integer and a string with a plus operator. And there's actually this nice feature here in Colab where you can say search stack overflow. And it will actually Google the error message for you directly to try to find out why that happened. There are generally three types of um, errors that you'll run into. There are syntax errors. This is invalid Python code. Can anybody tell me what's wrong with the example there? What makes it invalid? This one. It's not Oh, there's a parenthesis at the last. 
missing a bracket, oh, right? Uh, missing a parenthesis here. Yeah, so yeah. if you wanted to add a, a cell to your code, you can sort of hover your mouse over the bottom like this, and you can either add a text cell or a code cell. I'm going to click the code cell, and I'm just going to paste this in, and we'll see what Python says about it. Run it. Yeah, it's not happy. Invalid syntax. It doesn't really tell me what's invalid about it, but you're right. It's the missing bracket. If I do that, everything's fine. Um, the next class of errors is runtime errors. This is legal Python code, but it but it's doing something that doesn't make sense. Anybody want to tell me what's what will cause a runtime error there? Thanks, Doctor. Print is spelled wrong. The print is spelled wrong. Now, why am I saying that's legal Python code if I spell the print, print wrong? The reason is print uh, is legal. That's Python assumes there's some function named print, and it's going to probably complain that that function doesn't exist. Yeah, it says name print is not defined. If I actually set print equal to print, will actually work, I think. Yes, it actually works. So it's legal Python because you could very well have a function named print, although it would not maybe, be, maybe not be the best choice of names, but you could have a function with that name. So it's legal Python, but it's a runtime error because when I first ran it, there just happened to be no function by that name. So that's a runtime error. And finally, a logic error. The code is legal and it actually runs fine, but it just gives you the wrong answer. Anybody? able to tell me why this is wrong? The logic you use. Yeah, it's in the wrong order, right? So it's giving you the inverse of that, actually, the negative age. Um, OK, so that's I'm sorry it. to interrupt you. Could you, um, could you define what you mean by legal versus illegal? Do you mean like a literal sense or a figurative sense and like what makes something legal versus illegal? Yeah, I mean it in a literal sense because um, if I, um, for example, I showed you that this misspelled print works if I actually define a function named print. Now, doing setting print to print was a little bit sort of silly, but I could define a function, and we haven't talked about how you define functions yet. We'll get to that eventually. But I could define a print function, and I could say it just does a print of hello from print. And then I can run, I don't actually have to pass it anything, and I can run that, and everything's fine. So print is legal Python. However, if I take off that parenthesis, it's now illegal Python. The Python interpreter says it's almost like um, a, a good way to think about it is legal English would be for me to say, my name is Mark. Um, if I said my Mark name is, that would technically not be legal English. Um, the, the print thing is like saying my name is Jordan. It's legal English, but it's just not right. It's incorrect. Um, information. So hope that helps. If not, ping me after the class or in the chat and we'll we'll do more. The next cop, uh, topic I wanted to talk about is comments. Um, comments are kind of interesting because Python doesn't care about them. They're literally uh, irrelevant to the Python interpreter and the running of the program. The way they work is you start a line, or really anywhere in a line, you put a, a hash uh, symbol. And that from that point to the rest of the line is ignored. And so I don't have an example of it here, but I'll, I'll just add one right now. I'll say print hi. And then I'll add a comment partway through the line. This is a comment. That dot's going to get me in trouble, so I'll get rid of that. And these lines are just completely ignored by Python. The only thing they do is the print. It's useful for documenting your code. So the reason you have these is you want to kind of keep a reminder or, or a message to yourself or to somebody in the future who has to uh, maintain your code 
so that they know what's going on here. It's, it's really for humans. Um, you, you can also add as many blank lines in a Python program as you want for spacing. I wouldn't put that many typically, but I like to use one blank line between uh, areas of different functions. Um, another thing you'll see very commonly is you'll, you'll have some code and you'll be like, I, I think this is causing problems. I wonder what would happen if I ran this program without that code. And the way to do that is just put a, pound, a, a hash at the beginning and that makes it a comment. And we will refer to this as commenting out code. So um, the nice thing about commenting out code is you don't lose it, it's still sitting there. And when you're ready to try it again, you can uncomment it. So we'll say comment that out or uncomment that, which means turning off the, the commenting. Okay, that's enough about comments. Um, I've used this term function and I gave you two examples, print and input are functions. Uh, as you saw, we use them to do input and output operations. And if you hear this technical term IO, it's always talking about input and output, getting data in and getting data out of a computer. But really all a function is, is a reusable piece of code. So you don't have to figure out how to make print work. Somebody's already implemented it for you. We typically will say that we call a function or invoke a function. And all that means is ask, we ask the function to do its job. The function has a certain job it does. And we call it to get it to do that job. And the way we do this is by writing the function name followed by brackets or parentheses. And as you, as you saw, like in print, we can say whatever we want there. We can pass it a string like hello, and we get hello out. We may optionally include some values, which we've been seeing all along. We can include more than one value with com uh, comma separated values like hello there. And we get what you would expect, hello there. But this is a general property of functions. You say the name, you have an open parenthesis or uh, bracket, you pass zero or more arguments. You could actually even do zero arguments and get an empty line coming out. And then the close bracket, and that's how we call functions. These things that we pass in the parens are called arguments. And you'll hear people saying, uh, I'm calling this function and I'm passing it this string test or I'm passing it some arguments. So that's the terminology you'll hear around that. I like to think of a function as a, as a work request and the arguments as the job specification. So generally the print is what I want to get done, but the details of exactly what I want printed and how I want it printed are provided through the arguments. Okay, a bit more about print. I already showed you this. You can uh, specify an empty argument list and you just get a blank line. Uh, try putting something here, like your name, and run this, and you'll see you've already done this. It, it does uh, prints whatever you put in that string. Um, a simple print with one string prints that, as you saw a little bit earlier. If you divide that string up into comma-separated strings, into pieces, you get... for you, um, and I'll do you the favor of adding a space between each one. Now, this is not running for some reason. I will try restarting it, but it doesn't seem to um, want to. Can you please zoom in? Zoom in, yeah, sorry about that. Is that better? So this, yeah. is, that, is that better? Okay. So this is, kind of gone to sleep on me. So this is an example of what I said earlier about if you need to restart the runtime, you'll do it through this runtime menu. So I'm gonna do runtime, restart runtime. Are you sure you wanna restart? That will kill all local variables, which I haven't explained what those are. So don't worry about that for now, but you will understand what that means later. So when I started the, um, restarted the runtime, you might have seen I got a little progress thing saying reconnecting, and now it's all, I've got the green checkbox. So let's see if this works now. Okay, so you see I got the same result, and that's because print says however many arguments you send me, I'm going to print them. If you give me more than one, I'm going to put a space between them, which is kind of a natural way of getting what you'd like. 
By default, we get a new line character. That's the end of the line. It's sort of like the carriage return or the enter that you that you uh, press when you're uh, entering input. And so we get this new line, this sort of wrap to the next line automatically at the end of every print request. We can override it with what's called a named argument, as you see here. So let me first print the, well, let me run this cell. The first um, print prints, my name is Mark. The second print prints next line. And in each case, there was a new line at the end of that. You can't see it, but it's there because the next thing printed out on the next line. But notice the next pair of prints is exactly the same, except I said end equals space. And what that means is instead of the normal end of line, I want you to just print a space. And so what it did was, my name is Mark. It didn't go to the next line. It just printed a space. And then it printed next line. And it did go to the next line. Or it, it printed a new line at the end, which you can't see. Um, play with this. Play around with this to get the idea of what it's doing. It's basically letting you customize what gets produced at the end of the line. We can also change the separator string using instead of end equals, we say sep equals. The separator is what character to place between multiple arguments. As you saw, the default um, separator is a space. I'm changing it here to a hyphen, right? So let's run. You can sort of guess what this is going to do. Instead of my space name space is space mark, it's going to have hyphens where the spaces would normally be, just as you'd expect. And you can even have an empty separator. So if you say sep equals quote, quote, that's an empty string, what would you expect to see there? Nothing between each word. And so if you run that, you get, my name is Mark, one word. Um, we're up to the time where I'd like to take a short break. So I'm just going to mention that there are some challenges here. Uh, uh, one quick uh, thing. Someone asked about multiple line comments, and let me come back to that after the break. Actually, both of these questions I'll take after the break. But I just wanted to point out that there's some challenges here, and I would like you to work on these um, as, as part of your homework assignment. So um, I'll leave those with you. We're not going to try to solve them in class now, but uh, take a look, a look at those when you get a chance. And let's uh, rejoin in 10 minutes, so that'll be 8.02 or so.
Okay, I think we'll pick up where we left off. Um, I do want to try to address the two questions. One was multiple line comment from Shagar. And the um, answer to that is technically there's no such thing as a multiple line comment in Python, but there's a way to do it using something called a triple quoted string, which I'll actually be talking about a little bit later. When we get to triple quoted strings, I'll explain how you can use those as a multiple line comment. Uh, also, Shubo asks, can we put a line feed in a single print command? And the answer is yes. You can use something called a new line character. And the way you would do that is you would say print, oops. You would say print, I, Backslash n is a shorthand for a new line character. And I'll explain the list of these, what we call escape characters. If you can say my name, backslash n is, backslash n mark. Close. Hi, Mark. Your screen is not visible. Oh, thank you. And I know. Um, my uh, font was too small earlier, and I apologize for that. I missed the comments about that in the chat. So if you feel that you can't read something or can't hear something, please just unmute and yell at me because I may or may not see the, don't be shy because I may or may not see the, uh, the chat in time. So going back to this example, I, I've, I'm printing a string, but I've inserted these special backslash n characters. And what those do is they insert a new one in, in line. So that's a way to, with one print uh, function call, to get multiple lines of output. And again, we'll, we'll talk about these uh, escape characters. There are a few of them. We'll talk about them when we get to strings. So in this section, we're going to start with numbers. Python has two types of numbers, integers. Uh, arbitrarily sized integers, which are just positive or negative whole numbers, and floats, which are arbitrary precision floating point numbers, like anything with, you can think of this, anything with a decimal in it um, is a floating point number. For the most part, you don't have to care. Python will actually do the right thing for you depending on what you're doing. Um, you can mix floats and ints, and typically the result will be a float. So what I'd like you to do is um, try copy pasting this uh, string of prints into the cell below it and run that sequence of prints and see if you can tell what's going on. I'll give you a minute to do that. So the first three ran for me, and the fourth one got an error. So let's look at the first one. 5 minus 6, that does what you would expect, a subtraction. 5 minus 6 is minus 1. Uh, 8 times 9, the asterisk is a multiplication. I actually don't have an addition here, but it would be 5 plus 6, and you get 11, obviously. Uh, 8 times 9 gives you 72. 6 divided by 2 gives you 3.0. Now the fourth one, 5 divided by 0, gave us... 
an error and it's called zero division error division by zero. So you can't do that in math and you can't do that in Python. So what I'm gonna do is just comment out that line in the same way we talked about earlier, I'm gonna insert a hash mark right there. I don't need the space, but it doesn't hurt to put it. And then I'm gonna run it again and now it just kind of keeps going. So the next one is five divided by two and that's 2.5. Um, that slash, by the way, is division. The, the uh, percent sign is an operator that does something called the modulus. And what that means is what's the remainder of dividing the first number by the second number? So if you did 5 divided by 2, that goes twice into 5 with 1 left over. So the remainder is 1 for that operation. Not used all that often, at least certainly not as much as addition in the, the other arithmetic operations. Um, this one, 2 times 10 plus 3, what would you expect that to be? Don't, don't look down here, but it's probably too late. Um, anybody have any guesses what that would be? 10 to 3. Yes, so it's 2 times 10 plus 3, which is 20 plus 3. If we wanted to do the addition first, we can group it with parentheses, and we get 10 plus right. 3 to happen first, and then we multiply by 2. So this is just to know that there is a certain set of ordering, a precedence, we call it, operator precedence, and if you want to alter that precedence, you can use parentheses to do that. And then the double star is exponentiation, so that's saying raise 2 to the power 4. If you don't remember that from from earlier years of math, it's um, it's basically saying take two and multiply it by itself four times. So two times two times two times two, which is four, eight, 16. So uh, that's how we do that. So these are just the different types of um, arithmetic expressions we can express in Python. And this table here summarizes all of the ones I just showed you and uh, shows the symbols, that the symbol that was used for each one. Sorry, Mark. Yes. Uh, sorry to cut you short. Okay, so I would like to ask, um, 6 divided by 2, why are we having 3.0 and not just 3? Why is it 3.0 and not 3? Division generally results in a floating point because uh, nothing... I, I, I guess that's just a property of division. But there is another operator I didn't show here which is the double slash. And the double slash essentially means give me the integer result of that division. So that should give me a, just a plain old three. Um, so if you just do plain division, you're essentially asking Python, give me the exact number, which is, which is pretty much guaranteed to be a floating point. If you actually want an integral number, then you give it a, the double slash. Now, if you, what happens if you give you know, division oftentimes doesn't result in an integer, like seven divided by two is, is three and a half. So if I do the, in, the uh, regular division, I get 3.5. If I do the double slash integer division, it gives me the closest integer below the result. So I, get, I still get an integer three. If I do nine, I'll get four. So hopefully that, hopefully that helps. So, so the, uh, hello? Yeah, so the uh, data type float is a, uh, what we can say is a default uh, for the Python, mm -hmm. floating data type. Yeah, division in Python by default yields a float unless you use the integer. In fact, they call it here real division and integer division in this table. Okay. Um, these operators, um, are operable on numbers, but also on strings. We haven't talked about what a string is, so I'll defer that. But some of these operators can be used on strings as well. That is really it for numbers and operators. I think this is the kind of thing where it will pay off to actually try some experiments, open a code block or a code cell, and just try some of these combinations and see what, see what you can learn about these. The modulus in particular can be tricky, but it's a very, um, it's a fun function to use for certain types of problems. The next, uh, oh, uh, Segar uh, entered into the chat BODMAS, which is an acronym for the operator precedence rules. Um, and I don't even remember how it goes. Do, can you 
Can anybody rem remember how to expand that? Yeah. Addition, subtraction, division, multiplication, addition, subtraction. What's the B and O? What was it? Bracket. Yeah. Bracket. I, yeah. Um, it's bracket, others, division, multiplication, addition, subtraction. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. So that's one way to remember all the rules. Let's talk about strings. Uh, a string is just a sequence of characters. We sometimes call it a character string or just a string. Um, it gives you the ability to operate on this on this sequence as if it was one thing, one unit. And it's a gen it's an example of a general data type in Python that we call a sequence. We'll see more examples of those. But because it's uh, implemented as this sequence, we can do certain operations on it that are very natural and that work equally well with other sequences. You can delimit a string with either a single quote or a double quote, but within one string, you have to be consistent. So this example, like here, this works with a double quote on each end and the single quote on each end, they both work fine. But this example where you start with this double and end with a single or vice versa, neither of those are going to be okay. And you can open a code cell and try those yourself and you'll see Python will not be not be happy. And that is going back to Jordan's question. That's an example of illegal Python. Um, how do you put a quote in a quote? Sorry, was there a question? No. Uh, how do you insert a quote in a quote? Well, if you want to embed a single quote in a double quoted string, oh, and by the way, the choice of single quote or double quote is perfectly up to you. It's arbitrary. Uh, as long as you don't break the rule I just mentioned. The one thing I would say is it's good to be consistent, right? So I wouldn't do quotes with double quotes half of, on half of your code and single quotes on the other half. It's not, it'll still be legal Python and work fine, but it's just a good practice to be consistent. Um, so getting a quote in another quote, if you want to put a single quote in a double quoted string, that works fine. And vice versa, if you want to put a double quote in a single quoted string, that's fine. But a single quote in a single quoted and a double quote in a double quoted will not work. And I invite you to try these uh, in a code cell and you'll see uh, what I mean. So, okay, what if I really want a double quote in a double quoted string or I really want a single quote in a single quoted string? And the answer to that comes back to uh, the question that was asked about how do you get a new line character? You use these special things called escape sequences, which are always of the form backslash and then the thing you want to sort of sneak through. That's why they call it escape. So if I want a single quote inside a single quoted string, let me just copy this one, open a coat cell. And I'm going to start without the, ex the backslash and you'll see Python is not happy with me. Invalid syntax. Now I'm going to escape the single quote inside the single quoted string by putting a backslash before it. And now Python's perfectly happy. If I put a double quote at the beginning and the end, I don't need to escape it anymore because a single quote inside a double quoted string is perfectly legal. If I make that a double quote, it's no longer legal. But if I escape it, it is. So hopefully that makes sense. There's a table here with all of the different escape sequences, tab, new line, single quote, double quote, and backslash itself is just done with two backslashes. Now there's an error in my table here. So I think I need to do this. There we go. Okay, so two backslashes. Um, the next cell has some examples. So I invite you to run this cell. And let's just take a quick look at these. Quote the raven nevermore. We're backslashing the double quotes so that we can sneak them through a double quoted string. So as you can see, the output preserves the double quotes because we escaped them. Same story here, except we're escaping a single quote in a single quoted string. This is showing the uh, new line inserted into a string. And so when we print this, we get line one, line two, line three, all on separate rows. Same deal here, except backslash T is a tab, so it spreads out these three fields, one, two, and three. This is an example of where a double backslash escapes a backslash. So if we actually wanted a backslash in a string, let me show you what happens if you don't do this. If you just have the single backslash, and let's run this. 
but the single backslash is escaping the D, and the single backslash here is escaping the F, which is actually an escape sequence I didn't mention. So you just don't get what you would want. You get this mess. Um, but if you really want a backslash there, you put the double backslash. That's escaping the backslash. Why is that important? Well, in Windows, backslash is the folder separator character. And so you really sometimes need to specify that backslash like this. And by escaping it, you get what you would expect. Um, I won't do the last one because it's a combination of things we've already seen. Now, one more type of string I want to tell you about is triple quoted string. And the, this is the way you define a long string that spans multiple lines or or a string that you want to include characters you would normally have to escape, but you don't want to deal with all those backslashes. So the way you do this is you put three quotes in a row, and you can have it be multiple lines. You can put things like single quote and double quote, and you don't need to do anything fancy with backslashes. And when you print that, it just works. It just does what you'd expect. Here are the characters you intended without having to be escaped. Every line for line comes out as you would expect. Um, and just with, as with regular quotes, these single quote, three single quotes can be three double quotes. But if you start with three double quotes, you better end with three double quotes or Python's going to get mad. So let's do that. The, uh, the notebook's a little too helpful. When I put the single quote, it's adding the double quote. That's why I had to backspace over those. But now I have three single quotes opening and three single quotes ending, and everything's fine up to you which of the single or double quote again that you want to use. But when you use three, we call it a triple quoted string and it can spill over multiple lines and there's no need to escape anything. Um, here's a challenge for you. Uh, was there a question? Okay, Mark. So long string, does, does it actually mean that is a variable? Did you declare a variable for the even though uh, it yes, this longster variable. Yeah. And what, what, was the question, what is that? How did I declare that variable? I want to be sure if that is a variable. Yes. So we're coming up to uh, variables in the next section or um, shortly variables right there. And I apologize for using a variable before explaining what it was. But um, actually, I'm going to, I'm glad you asked this question because it just reminded me, I didn't mention the answer to the comment, the multi-line comment question. So yeah, this is a variable and we're assigning this string to this variable, but I'll explain that better in a few minutes. But if I wanted to just put a comment here, what I could do is get rid of the assignment and just have a quote sitting out there. Now this is essentially a comment. It's technically not. Uh, but you can think of it as virtually the same thing as a multi-line comment. So if you ever have like a block of code and you want to comment out the whole chunk, put a triple quote at the beginning and the end and it'll, the whole block will be commented out. Um, that still prints because it remembers long stir from the last time I ran the cell, but um, probably shouldn't get too into this now because it'll get confusing. Any questions on anything so far? So you said that it's kind of up to us whether we do single quotes or double quotes as mm -hmm. long as you're consistent, but is there, like is one more conventional than the other? Is there a reason why you would want to pick one or the other? Or does it really not matter? You no, know, it's like, like, it's actually, it's like cats and dogs. You know, if you like, sing, I use single quotes because I just, for some reason I find them more pleasing than double quotes. So I generally use single quotes, but I often break my rule, my own rule. So there's no real, um, best practice as far as I know. Maybe there is and I haven't been paying enough attention, but they both work fine and you're free to go with whatever work, whatever you like. All right, great. Um, there's a bunch of examples here and what I'd like you to do, not right now, but as a homework challenge is go through these strings. Don't actually put them into a code cell, just like you, you, you know, um, look at them and see if you can tell me if it's a legal Python string or not. So that should be fun to take a look at. And these are all somewhat famous quotes from movies. So anyway, try that, that one. Um, string operators 
So I mentioned earlier the plus operator and the multiply, the star operator, can be used on strings, but I hadn't yet told you what a string was. So let's see what that, ha what that looks like when we apply those operators. Um, I'm going to comment out two of these so that I can sort of reveal these gradually. So we print cat, and then we print cat plus videos. But what happens when you add? I don't think it's right to say add. When you use the the plus operator, apply the plus operator to two strings, it does what we call concatenation. It just kind of combines them one after the other. Cat videos is the result here. And I got the space between them because I had it in the string. If I didn't have that space there and I combine them, I just get one word, cat videos. What happens if I multiply cat by three? Anybody want to guess? Cat, cat, cat. <laughs> so gives me three versions of the, the string. And if I change the string, I get three versions of the original string, my cat, my cat, my cat. How about this one? Anybody want to guess what happens when I add three to cat? Yes, that's right. got a couple uh, good guesses on the chat. Yeah, it's, it's an error because you cannot add a string to an integer. Now, it is important to, to sort of stop and understand the difference between this three and, sorry, between Shouldn't have done that. Between this three and this three, right? One is an integer and one is a string. So if we print the number three plus three, we get six. And one thing I'm showing you here is if you're ever not sure what type something is, there's a type function. So here I'm saying print type of three plus three. So you just pass the type function, the thing you want the type of, and it tells you that's what you're seeing here where it says class int. Don't worry about the word class for now. The int is really the information that's useful here. So this is telling us three plus three, the result of adding three and three is an integer. This print just gives me my blank line. And then I do print three plus three. And as we saw that concatenates two strings. So we get 33. Now that's not really the number 33, that's the string 33. It looks the same, right? They look exactly the same. So there's no obvious way to tell that that's a string versus a number by staring at it. But if you do call type on that result, it tells you this is actually a string. So um, how do we like solve this problem of wanting to do cat plus three? Maybe what I meant, the first question is what, what did I actually mean? What was I trying to do there? If it's the number three, it really doesn't make sense. But if it's the string three, then I should convert that to a string. How do you convert something to a string? You use the stir function. And there's actually a simpler way to do it, which is to literally say int cat plus string three. But oftentimes, the thing you're operating on isn't a literal value, it's a variable, which I'll show you in a minute. And so you can also use the stir function, which says pass something in and convert it to a string. So that works as well. There's also something called string methods, and these are things you can call on a string. They're like functions, but they're specific to a data type. And so, for example, with strings, you can call the method upper. As you might guess, that converts the string to all uppercase. You can call lower, which converts it to all lowercase. You can call title, which uh, capitalizes every word in the string. So let's run those. And you get upper cat, lower cat, and titleize Lord of the Rings. So again, play with these, make a code cell, experiment with them. Um, and now on to variables and assignment. I'll try to go a little quickly through here because we're getting up to an hour and a half. Um, variables are really, really important. They are a label for a piece of data. So the way I like to think of variables as I think of them as a box. And you put something in the box. And you can take it out and change it with another value. But the box is like a reference to the thing that's inside the box. So I'm creating a variable called name. And I'm putting in the box the string mark. 
I could just as easily, well, yeah. And then when I print it, I get what's in the box. I get what the variable refers to. Now I could also say name equals any type at all. Like if I wanted to, I could say 3.14. Now if I print name, I get 3.14. And so um, whatever I put on the right-hand side of the equal sign gets put into the box with that name. Now, a couple of things. This name, name, calling the name, name is really confusing, and I shouldn't have done that. But that can be any word I want. So let me call it var for variable. And if I set mark to, or if I put mark in the box named var, then that's the name I want to refer to when I print it. I could also call it um, foo. As long as I refer to it with the same name I use to assign something to it, it works. You'll notice I'm using the same name. Fumi. I'm using the same name over and over in this example, and that sort of gives you a clue as to what happens when you assign again to the same variable. It just replaces it. It just says whatever's in that box, throw it away and put this new thing in. Now, before we get more into assignment, let's just talk about some of the rules about names. There's some simple rules. They have to start with a letter or an underscore. Um, the rest of the characters in the names can be letters, numbers, underscores, et cetera. Um, and case matters, meaning uppercase and lowercase matter. So all lower names is a different variable from all upper name, which is a different variable from a mixed case version. There's some reserved words that you can't use as variable names. The full list is right here. And that's because these um, are needed for special functions in Python. If you try to use one of these as a variable, you'll see that Python will, will tell you, sorry, but you can't assign to a keyword in this case, because true is on this list of reserved words. There are not that many of them, but um, if occasionally you'll run into, you'll, you'll, it always happens that you forget one of these has a special meaning and you'll try to set up a variable with it and Python will tell you right away not to do that. So um, here's a bunch of possible names. And I want to ask if anyone can tell me which of these, most of them are actually fine, but I want to ask if anyone can tell me which ones are illegal. Just shout out one that you can, that you think is illegal. 50 yard line. 50 yard line is illegal because it starts with a, with a non-alphabetic character. Yep. Any others? The Lady Gaga that starts with an underscore, same reason. That one's actually okay. Oh, it was underscores okay. Underscores okay to start a line, but let's, I always like to check and make sure because sometimes I get confused. Yeah, so that's okay. It didn't give me anything back, but that's because it, it's okay. If I had violated a rule, it would have given me an error back. So yeah, okay, so that one's okay. Any other illegal ones? Somebody posted in chat the my cat is with hyphens, and that's right. You can't have hyphens because hyphen is the minus operator. So you're kind of like saying, I want to subtract cat from my, which is making no sense. There's one more. Which one? Print. Raise this one or or print. Let's try them both. They both look suspicious, right? But actually, one of them's okay and one's not. That's not it. Raise is not going to work because it's a reserved word. Now, print. I'm not going to actually do this because it's going to ruin my session. But I can do this. And if I do that, then I've just redefined print. Totally legal, but the next time you call the print function, uh, it's not going to work very well. It's going to be legal Python, but it's not going to work well. I'll do this at the end so that I don't have to restart my, uh, my runtime. OK, we've covered uh, numbers. Um, 
strings and variables. Now I want to talk about assignment statements, which you've already seen. But the basic syntax here is you say the name of the variable equals a value. Now the value could be a string, it could be a number. And the example here shows a bunch. So I say instructors mark, instructors my evil twin, instructors fit 42. And I can vary the name and I can vary the value. But all I'm doing is putting some value in a box with a name on it. You can try some experiments like this. Setting A to 0, setting A to 42, setting A to a float, setting A to a string. Now I'm adding another variable, B equals 42, and I get A equals mark, B equals 42. Here I set A equal to B. What do you think that does? That says uh, what I want to put in box A is whatever B refers to. Sign. Same, exactly. So the B was 42 up here. When I say A equals B, I'm sort of copying what's in the B box into the A box. And so they both have 42 at the end of that one. So let's talk about variables and assignments in a more, I, I, I said at the beginning I wanted this to be practical. So let's talk about how is this useful? What, is these vari what are these variables buying me? And let's imagine I asked you to print a list of the first nine multiples of nine. So you write this program for me, one times nine, print two times nine, all the way up to nine times nine. And I say, okay, that's, that's cool. That's giving me exactly what I would expect, nine through 81. But there's something I don't like about it. And here's a nicer version using a variable. I say the thing I want to multiply by is nine. So I set a variable to that value. And then instead of printing one times nine, two times nine, I do print one times the variable factor, two times the variable factor, and so on. Does it work? It does. It gives me the exact same answer. So my question for you is, why is this better? Functionally, it seems like it's the same thing. What's better about it? Yeah, because we, if we want to change the multiplier, then we can just change the factor value and it will give another multiplication table. Right, exactly. So if I said to you, you know what? I don't like nine so much anymore. I want a table of the multiples of eight. How many lines would you have to change in this version? You have to go and change nine lines of code and that's why I call it tedious. In this version, I'm not even going to do the other one because it's too annoying. But in this version, I change one line of code. And it works. Now I have factors of 8. I can do the same thing with factors of 7. So this is generally why we use variables so that we get this level of indirection and then we can refer to the variable. And if we change what's in that box, it just sort of automatically gets picked up everywhere. Coming soon is an even better way to write this program using something called a loop, which I'm not going to get into right now, but it enables us to get this down to three lines of code, and we'll see that soon enough. Here's another challenge for you. I'll let you work on it. Um, you have a program that is going to figure out how many cans of cat food you need to feed your 10 cats. Um, I want to tell you about string formatting. So sometimes you want to make a string have a certain shape or look or content. And a good way to do this is with something called F strings. And the way you form an F string is you just put an F before the single or double quoted string. And then inside the string, you have a brace, open brace, a variable name, and a close brace. So in this case, I've got a variable my name equals mark. It could be anything, foo. As long as I'm consistent, so I refer to it in this F string as foo. And what Python does is it says, okay, I see the F, this is an F string. It means that I'm going to see these braces somewhere in here. And whenever I do, I'm going to substitute the variable for its value. So if I print message, I get my name is Mark. If I change, I already showed you changing the variable name. If I change the variable content to Maya, it says my name is Maya. Python says whatever foo is in the foo box, I'm gonna put it into this string. Now the way we used to do this in the past before, these F strings are relatively new in Python. The way we used to do this in the past was, well, there are several ways we used to do this, but one of the most painful ways was with concatenation. I told you already that if you add a string to another string, it just combines them together. So imagine this problem where we have fruit pointing to, or uh, 
is, a, is assigned a, a type of fruit, quantity is assigned a number, and unit cost is assigned another number. We calculate the total cost as unit times quantity. And now I want to say quantity uh, of this quantity of oranges is this total cost. Now look at all the mess I have to do for this. I have to first convert quantity into a string. Then I have to add the space. Then I have to put the add the fruit, and so on. I mean, it just this is just really annoying code. It works, but it's just not something you want to have to do. The easy way is to use the f string. The rest of this code is exactly the same, but look how nice the output assignment is. I just say f string quantity fruit cost, and I'm interpolating these. Don't worry about the colon point two f for now. It's a subtlety. But it does the exact same thing in a way that's much more readable, I think. Here's a challenge for you. Rewrite the cat food program using um, F strings. I said using string formatting. I should say using F strings. So that's a challenge for homework. Um, and I wanted to just briefly look at a couple quick example programs because so far all we've done is like fragments, like little snippets of code just to kind of explain a concept. But I want to show you a couple examples of doing something actually useful on an end-to-end -end basis but with some real code. Um, and this is going to expose things I haven't explained yet. I just want to give you a sense of how readable Python is and how short it is to do a job. So let's imagine I asked you to print a multiplication table from 1 to 10, not just like all the multiples of 9, but all the multiples of every number by every other number. I have something called a loop that goes from 1 to 10. I print the number I'm going to start multiplying by at the beginning. Then I have another loop that goes from 2 to 10. And then I print all the multiples, and at the very end of each row, I print a new line. And I'm using end equals space to avoid wrapping a new line at the end of every, every number I print. Don't worry if this doesn't make sense. Um, just sort of like surf, surf over it for now. But I just want to show you how easy it is to produce something um, methodical like this where I've got this very nice little multiplication table with just five lines of code. Another example is, let's imagine I want to do a search of a database on the web. So IMDB, probably many of you know what that is, Internet Movie Database. Um, it has information about every movie ever made. And um, so what I'm going to do is run this command that installs a library that someone else wrote to search the IMDB. And as I said earlier, one of the big reasons for using programming languages is to reuse other people's code and not reinvent the wheel. So that's exactly what I'm doing here. I'm loading a Python library that someone else wrote. I don't have to care about how it works, what it does, why. Well, I care about what it does, but I don't care about the internals. And then here I'm just going to use it. And the way I use it is I set the title I want to search for in IMDB. I do a couple of function calls to do the the, the search that I actually want passing my title. So I'm setting this variable to the title. And if I change the value I'm assigning to that variable, I'll end up doing a different search. And then I go through a loop through the results and I get the movie information and I get a little thumbnail image of the movie. So let's run that. This is actually going out to the internet, querying IMDB, if it works, fingers crossed, there we go. Uh, I had it print out the the title, the rating on IMDb, and a little thumbnail of the image. And so you can see there are a lot of movies that match. There's an animated version. I'm not sure what that is. Troll Carlin and Oz. Maybe someone knows that language. Um, but the main one we were looking for was right here. And uh, if I change the name here, um, I always have to be careful about what I type here because sometimes I get back weird results. Um, Godfather. 
So by changing the contents of the title box, as I keep using that metaphor, by changing the value that I assigned to that title, it got automatically picked up when I did this search function call here, and I got back a different set of results. OK, enough about that. Um, Python is really popular in terms of um, data science, statistics, data analysis, all that kind of stuff. And for good reason. It's just got a huge wealth of tool, tooling in that domain. And one of the most fun things to play with is data visualization. So I'm using here, I'm going to generate a histogram. I'm importing a, a graphing package called Seaborn. There are a bunch of different Python graphing packages you can use. I'm just using this one because I like it. And what I've done is I just took from the spreadsheet that you all, uh, the, the form you all filled out with the country you're in, I just grabbed those countries and put them in a list. I haven't explained lists yet, so don't worry if this you're not sure what I'm talking about on this line of code. But it's basically a sequence, just like a string is a sequence of characters, a list is a sequence of strings in this case. So I just put all of the countries you're all from in this list. And then I just say count plot. I'm calling a function in the Seaborn uh, library. And I pass it this variable, countries. Let's run that. You can run it as well. And you can see with one line of code, basically, OK, two if you include the import. And I haven't told you what an import is, but I will. Um, you get this nice histogram. It shows us that the UK and India are the most represented in this course followed by US and Afghanistan. And then we have one person each from Israel, Sweden, and Nigeria. What happens if I change the data? Let's say I add one person from India. What I've done is I've just changed the assignment to the country's variable. I've just changed what is sitting in the country's box. If I rerun that, when I call count plot with this, with this modified version of the country's variable, it's going to see that. And now, in is one higher just because I added that extra value. It's also nice that I didn't have to do the counting manually. I just threw this list and the count plot took care of the frequency uh, analysis for me. Okay, coming up on the end here, I just want to share a few resources. I won't go through these, um, but I invite you to take a look at them. One of them is my favorite books for beginning Python students, which you might like. Uh, this one in particular, I want to just take you to Coding Bat. This is really fun. It's an interactive site where you get problems to solve. So for example, uh, we have two monkeys, A and B. Actually, I won't try this. But what it does is you enter some code, you say go, and it will test your code against a bunch of examples and tell you if you got it all right or not and let you keep going if you didn't get it right. It's really fun. Uh, Documentation. So there's an official site. There's Google, which, as I said earlier, is, is the, probably the one I use the most. There's also a help function built into Python. If you say help print, you get a quick um, bit of information about the print function. If you say help input, you get information about the input function. And you get the idea. Um, for next week, I would love for you to watch this short video on Colab, just to give you a little bit more background on that. Um, I will not play that. Um, and then there's a notebook that tells you about notebooks. So that's this one. You can check that out. I'd recommend, if you want to dive deep, uh, read chapter one from the book I talked about earlier. Um, make a copy of this notebook if you haven't done, and do the four challenges. Um, actually, the challenges above. and sort of throughout the stuff we've been doing. Sorry. Complete the challenges above. Um, if you haven't made a copy of this notebook, do that before you work on it, because you won't be able to actually save anything in my version of the notebook. Um, and then, Review the, the, the steps we went through today uh, and try the four questions below. I've got four questions here. And if you open these up, you'll have a place to add your code. And then there's a solution here. But I, I um, highly recommend you don't double click there and see the solution. Try to get it yourself. If you get stuck, take, give yourself a break, ask questions. Uh, but you'll learn much more if you kind of work through it than if you just reveal the answer and see, oh, that's how it's done. 
Um, any last questions before we adjourn? I see there's one question from Ma Maiv. Uh, could you do print uh, message plus dot format? Yes, there is a format function in Python, which is a similar way to do stream formatting. So I didn't introduce that just because there are something like four different ways to solve that problem. I find the F strings the most intuitive, but, but there's also something called format, which you're welcome to take a look at. The Python documentation is quite good. If you go to my resource site, you'll see a link there. And everything you want to know about Python can be, can be learned here. So check that out. Um, not seeing any other questions. So I'll, I'll just uh, invite you to let me know if there's anything I can do better or improve. And if you... If some of this didn't sink in, didn't make sense for you, don't worry. That's the normal experience in your first exposure to programming. So don't worry. It's going to be okay. Um, let me know if you really feel lost, if just none of this made any sense to you, or if you just feel stuck, you can't answer some of the questions, and, I'll, and we'll, we'll, we'll get you sorted out. Uh, Mark, uh, I have one question. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there any pointer or memory location kind of concept in Python? Oh, yes. You, I think I saw that in there and I forgot to answer it. Um, there are no, there, there's no such thing as pointers in Python the way there is in C and C++. Uh, and one of the reasons is that Python sort of hides that whole idea from you. Um, the other nice thing about Python, which I didn't mention, is it manages all the memory you allocate. With older languages like C and C++, you, you can actually address chunks of memory through these things called pointers that you're talking about, which is kind of powerful. But it has a big cost, which is that you have to, you have to manage that memory. And with Python, you, you don't have the pointers, but you also don't have the job of having to keep track of everything you've allocated. Anybody else? If anybody else has questions, just stay online. You can unmute and we'll talk. Um, otherwise, I think your our our class is officially over. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you, Mark. Thank you. thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Coyote, if you're still there, you asked, are we submitting the challenges? And no, you're, you're, you're on, that's just for you to, to try out. There are no tests. All right, thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's one of the only courses you may have these days that will not, you won't get a test or a grade. <laughs> <laughs>